Alrighty then, we are recording. Recording. Well, twenty-five. Here, ten twenty-five, Mexico. <laughs> That's right. Why don't you go ahead and make it hot? <laughs> make it hot. Make it hot, Janet. Make it hot. Make it hot. <laughs> oh, hot, 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 caliente, hot. por favor. All right. So, welcome everyone. Hi. Thanks for joining us on Reflect Recalibrate. Woo woo. <laughs> We're so happy you're here. Remember to tell your friends, your family, and your foes, yes, your foes, that they too can learn about artivists and artivism by subscribing to RFC anywhere they listen to podcasts. They can also watch and subscribe on YouTube at Reflect Calibrate the Podcast. Well, I think that's that. Now let's get into it. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Reflect Recalibrate. What? Jazz hands. Mm. How does that always happen? We go to jazz hands. I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I'm Danny Snyder. And I'm Janet E. Dandridge. And we are your two lady artivists, lovely hostesses of this podcast. Today, our epic guest is going to be Yasin Talala Fall. But before we bring her on... Oh, now we're doing the robot. First, it was jazz hands. I know, right? It was I jazz hands, I robot, can't. you know. <laughs> All right. So I think we should talk a little bit first about what's been happening this week. Yeah. And I don't even think we have to talk much about it, but just to like acknowledge it. And w- what I'm referring to is the shootings that happened in Atlanta and in Colorado. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people saying like, oh, we're turning back to normal, which I don't. Yeah, your eyes are saying enough of that. I don't think we even need to like address that. But I do think we can take a moment of silence to show some compassion and show some respect for the families who have lost loved ones and the friends of loved ones. And yeah, yeah. so let's just take a, a pause. I think your your shirt is very appropriate for today, Janet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is this is one of the reasons why I chose to wear this t-shirt today because I have been thinking about breath and breathing and what it means to live, what life means and what it means to exist with others harmoniously. So having all of what has been happening in the States with everything that has been consistently happening. Um, You know, I just, you know, it's just a good message for people, you know, this catharsis, you know, breathing together, especially for those that we have lost to senselessness. I really appreciate you articulating that because I have a really like this week I've had being in Mexico and having a lot of Mexican friends asking me about what's happening in the States. And I really have a hard time articulating it, explaining it. I'm empathizing a lot, but even trying to describe how I'm empathizing is really hard for me. And so I appreciate what you just said, because I think you articulated that really well. For sure. For sure. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on, on this subject on this issue before we proceed into something way more fun. (laughs) Something that actually gives us, you know, someone who actually provides us with those moments to breathe, I think, uh, with her work. Um, I, I don't have anything else to say. I think that's something, you know, we can move into, uh, 
uh, conversation with Yasin about because, you know, her work gives us that catharsis for me, at least what I've seen yeah. and what I've um, understood. So I'd love mm -hmm. to chat with her about that. Yeah. And I think for those people who are listening today who don't know how to channel some of their energy, because like definitely for me at first, I was like, I don't, I still am trying to figure out how to channel all this energy that I have, the anger, the frustration, the sadness, all of it. Please go check out our Instagram where we offer some resources, where we're offering activist groups, as well as some artists who might give you some inspiration, whether it be relief, whether it be figuring out your next action. Yes, please go to our Instagram and check that out. All right. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about Yasin. Yeah? Let's yeah. talk about her. Yeah. She is so cool because she does so much stuff. She's an interdisciplinary conceptual performance artist based in Washington, D.C., but I believe she grew up in Florida, so maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. Yeah. She uses natural materials to investigate concepts of heritage, ritual, function, history, identity, faith, labor, politics, so much. And not just via performance, but also sculpture, painting, installation, and all of it through this lens of her body. So inspired by her Senegalese and Mauritanian heritage, her work and practice speak to the human body and its entangled relationships with these forces. I'm really excited to learn more about yeah. that. Yeah. And check this out. I love this. When she describes herself, when I'm asked to describe herself in one word or phrase, she said, material junkie. I'm curious as to uh, what that exactly means, being a material junkie. I don't think it's the same as being a hoarder. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. being a material junkie and also for fun, she loves to make jewelry, make clothing. Apparently a new thing during quarantine is growing plants. I'm really also, like you said, Janet, I'm also really moved by her work and I'm really excited to soak up some yes. of her aura today. Yeah. We're so fortunate to have her here today for a second podcast on the genealogy of artivism. So yes. big, big round of applause. Where are you, Yassine? Yay! Hey, oh, 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 what's, oh, up, what's oh, up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? How are you guys? <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for being, with us. being here. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question that's kind of like a background Go question. Can I start with this, Janet? Is that okay? Yeah, please, please. Let's cool. do this. Okay. I was thinking before we get deep into the pieces that you've done or the pieces that you're working on right now, for sure. I'd like to have a little bit more background about your Senegalese and Mauritanian heritage and the significance of your name fall. Like I know a little bit, but I don't think our listeners will know what the significance of your last name is. Oh, so that's really funny. Um, well, both of my parents are from Dakar, but on one side of my family, um, both my grandparents migrated from Shingeri to Dakar, so from Mauritania to Dakar, and um, yeah, that's kind of just the basis of, you know, my family in general, so that's, it's, my lineage is very important to me, but Fall is like just a really big last name in, in Senegal, it's connected to like the first disciple of a holy man sitting Tuba, there's a whole city that he made, it's named after him, there's a whole mosque dedicated to him and where he's buried, etc., um, but his first religious disciple was, his name was Sheikh Ibrahim Mafal. So, you know, it's like, you know, in terms of the community, which is very much like, uh, Islam is like a large part of the culture of the community of just like even social interactions and whatnot. So it's a pretty, it's just a pretty big and very common last name, <laughs> mm, <laughs> but it's got is... some significance religiously, you know? Oh, okay. So it's some religious significance because fall, you know, when I think of Dakar, I'm just like, Fall, uh, I don't think about fall. I think of like fall makes me yeah. think of an English last name, you know? What yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. But so. it's pronounced fall. That's if you pronounce oh. it fall. It's pronounced fall. Yeah. Okay, so, so when I was reading about Bayafal, the spiritual leader, I found it really interesting how he led a pacifist revolution against yeah. the French colonists. Yeah, this was which all, the French yeah. Yeah, this is so like I, turmoil of decolonization or like near the end of colonization, going into decolonization. He was like exiled from Senegal for a while. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of radical, radical stuff. <laughs> it's pretty radical stuff, yeah. Yeah, it sounds And I'm curious, how do you pull inspiration from that? So it's very inspiring. Like um, in terms of my, you know, connections to 
like my family lineage and whatnot and just like blood relatives like I have a lot of family members that are Baifa. I have a lot of um, uncles and whatnot that are like marabous, you know, like in terms of like spiritual, like community leaders, et cetera. So it's very much just a part of, you know, it's always been a part of my family. Like I grew up hearing about like, you know, stories of like one related to in this respect. So like Sidim Tuba, you know, like growing up hearing stories about him and like the miracles he performed and et cetera, you know, and things that he did for the community. So it's been inspiring in a sense because I feel like, you know, the way, because it's all wrapped up in Islam for me, you know, it's very culturally significant, but it's also all wrapped up in religion and in faith. So coming at it from a point where, you know, you're being told like kind of these like fantastical narratives of like holy men and whatnot and like the miracles they perform and what they do and like their connections with God, et cetera, you know, um, coming at it from that perspective, there's like a lot of animism. There's still like all of, you know, that pre-colonial polytheistic, like um, care for elements and care for like na the natural environment and like the power of material and the power of using that to connect with the unseen and all of that, that's very present. So that for me is like really like what I took away. And I think what finds its way into like all my work for sure. Can you elaborate more on the actual materials that you use, these natural pieces? Of oh, yeah. Paper? I feel like it was really something, I don't know, even since I was a kid, it's like I wanted to be a doctor. Okay, initially. That's like, this is more background. Like I went to school thinking that I was going to like be a surgeon and like do pre-med. Like I was like hell bent on it. But, oh. like, throughout high school. Yeah. Like I was just really, really interested. I was really, really good. And I aced all my anatomy and physiology classes, et cetera, et cetera like one on programs and whatnot. So I was really interested in the human body in general. I was like big on dissecting things because of the fact that I'm Muslim, you know, there's a holiday where you have to kill a lamb, right? My dad is the type of dude to bring the lamb home and kill it in the house, you know? And I'm one of three siblings that are ladies. So they're very squeamish and they like freak out, you know? But I was always the person that was like, no, I'm gonna get neck deep in it. And anything in regards to natural material, including like living things, you know, it's always been an interest of mine. So when I got to art school, I kind of just got wrapped up in twining. Like it was the first thing I started doing was like making rope. And that was kind of like the beginning of, it was that and, and, and um, clay for me, you know? And I feel like more so now I'm working with, especially on projects that I'm doing right now, I'm working with a lot of sisal and a lot of jute and a lot of twine, you know? Um, but in, as, as a supplement for clay, because I don't have access to a clay studio at the moment. So that's like kind of, you know, in terms of material, that's where I'm at right now. But I think it all started really when I started learning how to throw. And I had just really great professors that were, you know, talking to me about, okay, how are you going to like put your body into your work? You know, where is it? We want a little more presence. Like what, what are you doing? Like, what do you want to do really with what you make? And I'm like, I really want to physically interact with it. That's just what I want to do. You know, mm. so I kind of got to a point where working with clay and then just working with something so malleable to me was so interesting. And then I don't know why there's something about how like tedious and just how repetitive throwing to me is on a wheel. And it's the same thing with tying knots. I find myself doing the same thing. It's that same type of like presence, but also like meditative state, you know, and I found myself drawn to that. And it was just and naturally, you know. I found myself drawn to just natural material, like weaving grass, weave, because that's what, you know, in terms of traditional techniques, like making rope is like one of the oldest, you know, technological advancements like ever, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like weaving in a sense, is like one of the oldest technologies ever. So just, it, it really made yeah. me want to delve in to see like, okay, like how am I going to now work with everything like from the ground? Like now when I dye fabric, like how am I going to do it in a way where I can use, you know, actual, um you know natural material and natural items are like you know like I use lemon and like honey and like turmeric in a last in my last performance so mm. it was just something that I uh I was just really drawn to it and then making and and, and getting involved with making rope and and throwing and also welding at the same time you know it's metal also is natural in a sense, you know, I work with a lot of metals in clay. So everything kind of just starts to speak to itself, you know, all of them to me connect at least in terms of practice. So that's kind of how I got wrapped up into that. You know, what a couple of different things you said, uh, two things that you said, weaving and, uh, you know, talking to them, talking to each other, conversation, yeah. those are two things that come up in your work when I think about it. I think about weaving and not only weaving, 
um, these materials that you can pick up and create and make, but weaving your body into the work. Your sure. body is part of the weaving as well. And yeah. then that conversation between the materials um, that actually happens because of how you're weaving them all together. It's just like they're all right. talking and they're having this conversation and making their right. own world. And that's when I'm when I'm watching the work and you know just looking at what's happening. I can see that world in creation with those materials. And I, and I think we just got a, a, a little bit of what <laughs> material junkie means. <laughs> right, right. No, yeah. So I'm, I'm a lover yeah, yeah. Of, of all materials and all tools. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. So I work like, um, as my formal job, like I've, I've, I've taught before, but I work formally as a preparator, you know, so I'm like hanging, you know, work in museums and stuff. So I work with a crew and like, every time somebody has a new tool, I'm sitting there, I'm like, what is that? <laughs> Tell me all about it. Can I use it? Can we try it out? Like what, what, you know, every, any, any, you know, any new material, if, it's, it's, it's just something of an interest of mine. A friend of mine found bones as she was um, walking through the river, you know? She just found some bones that were like, kind of like washed away and pretty nice. So she brought them to me and I made earrings. <laughs> I was like, let me dye them, you know? It's just like any, any type of thing. I'm like, ooh, okay, is it wearable? Can I, can I make an object out of it, you know? Are you working in your apartment? I literally am. I literally can you am. show us? Like, can you yeah, take yeah, us for yeah, a little for walk? Sure. So yeah, because I, we see you like looking. We messy. see you looking to the right. You know, like yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Over there. No, What's so happening? Um, <laughs> right now, okay, yeah. So this is my whole. Right now, I have a painting. Right now, I'm going, and this lady has no eyes yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> Her face is wild. But what this kind of was, material was that? This the, is the Sissel. Paint. Oh, the, oh, this well, the, the painting. Oh, the, yeah. The painting, this is veneer. So it's a, f uh, a friend of mine, I was working with them. They were getting rid of it. It's really beautiful, actually. Um, mm -hmm. It's like oh. super glossy. But yeah, I'm really just trying to do like a wash of this woman's face. She's a Senegalese poet um, oh, and writer. Exactly. Her name is Kine Kiramafla Kiramafal. Yeah. Uh, uh, but this I is, I know, yeah. So what's funny is I have, trans <laughs> I have this exhibit at Transformer right now and I have to work in my apartment because I don't have a studio space, right? So the yeah. the length of this ceiling, so this right here, uh -huh. spanned from 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 that two by four to that two by four. That's how wide it is, right? Oh. So I had to do that for the ceiling because the ceiling just so happens to fit on my wall, the length of it. Ah. I took measurements. <laughs> I took I took measurements of this space because I was like. I need to find a way to make an installation in my house and then be able to go make it in the space and have it be accurate because I can't work there. Exactly. So I was like, how am I going to figure that out? And then I was like, thank God my wall was like clear, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was meant to be. Yeah, so it was, was waiting awesome. and ready. It was waiting yeah. and ready for you. Exactly. So that's the piece, um, trying to be whole, living in Paris. Yeah, that's that piece. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is that. I, okay, so I, I, I did have the other question, but let's talk about yeah, this yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, about, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I have so many questions. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, so when you talk about trying to be whole, living in parts? Um, yeah. Yeah, blood, body, and faith. So I, um, Transformer reached out to me and they were asking me if I wanted to be a part of their, uh, you know, storefront exhibition series. But I had made this head form and there was just something about... I don't know. There's just something about weaving now for me. It's just changed a little bit. It's, it's really been my MO for like the past year to like get into a ceramic studio and like find access to a ceramic studio so I can make, you know, um, work in clay and like further develop my skills, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just not a feasible situation right now for me. So weaving to me has just become a different, you know, it's an experience that I now like associate with that, you know? So now I'm, I'm, I'm making things and I'm like, okay, you know? And when they reached out to me to ask me about making work, I was like, what am I going to make in reality? Like I had no project in mind and I was really like sitting there and I was like, I don't know what I even have to say at this point because I had mm -hmm. done my self portrait and making work during this time period has just been kind of difficult, you know? So yeah. And for me, it's like, I'm not about to make, I never want to make anything that seems like half considered, you know, in any respect. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm not going to make it if I don't like fully with my heart want to be like, yeah, this yeah, is the thing that I'm It does not look saying. like you do that you know? at all. You, oh my you God, thank God. <laughs> it, you, yeah, thank God, that's, at least it's yeah. working, you know, at least it's evident, but 
you know, I just, it's, that's something that kills me. So I was sitting and I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And what I've, what have I been getting into? What have, what have I been researching? And I've been really just interested in how being a first generation American and you're, and, and having a, a different level of proximity to tradition and like, um, religious faith and like even cultural tradition specifically, like coming from Senegal, for me, that's been something that's been, it's just really affecting my life at this moment in time, you know? And I think about women like me also that are like in America, because I have friends that are first generation and I ask them and it's been a conversation too. Like I have a friend who's Pakistani, another one who's Cameroonian and she was talking to me and we were like, there are some things that like, you know, sometimes you just feel like you can't say or like can't really express because it's from a completely different cultural mentality, you know? It's like, it's, it's, it's something that like, really like was just, you know, you were, you grew up with that being the normal in your house, but like we're in America. So it's this whole, like, it's this whole like sense of like navigating, um, like, kind of like your parents' decisions in a sense, you know, because leaving home wasn't really like our choice in terms of like, <laughs> you know? where yeah. you're born etc like leaving home you know but they really left their home country for specific reasons you know and I feel like the kids carry that naturally so I'm interested in that I'm interested in like why and how and 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 what it looks like you know to pick up and and and, and put down tradition you know to like make that choice and like navigate um being you know from a family or from a heritage or from you know, an entire uh, country that is very much um, functioning in a respect where as a woman, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's disheartening to a degree because there's just not much respect for women in Senegal, you know? I have a lot of like close relatives, like immediate relatives and cousins that like have not finished school, you know? And I have a cousin who is my age and she was brilliant, did not finish school and she's on her fourth baby, I'm 23 you know? Mm. So it's like the way, the way the world functions over there, being a woman is just such like, I can't really imagine what it would have been like for me to grow up there. So thinking about the fact that my mother like left home, you know, and that was really what my self-portrait piece was about. So now I'm thinking about the aftermath of that, you know, like what leaving home does, like the generational effects, what gets passed down, you know, or what comes back that the person in reality left their home for to avoid, you know? Mm. and like what kind of happens when you decide to like pick up and put down tradition you know that that makes me think of the Audre Lorde quote that we probably have all heard about self-preservation being an act of political warfare yeah bringing you bringing the family over here because she had an understanding of what it was a political decision it was a social it was yeah yeah it was very much like no I'm not about to because for her she was like there's nothing new about this. I've talked to my mom before and I asked her, I was like, why do you, she was like, because I would look around and like, just see the way things were moving, you know? Like I would like picture like where my life was headed. And I'm like, this is just, there's nothing new or challenging or like anything about this that is me, you know? And nobody else is asking this question that I'm asking right now. So like, I have to leave. And that's her choice. Cause she was like, I'm not about to raise children. Cause she knew she was going to have kids. She was like, I'm not about to raise daughters here. So that way they can feel like I do right now. No, you know? Yeah. Wow. So yeah. do you, did she ever tell you why she chose Florida? Cause you, cause did she move oh, to Florida? No. Directly, so or? I was, guess what? I was born in DC. Oh I was, yeah. I was born in <laughs> Janet, <laughs> Janet, were, Janet, were you born in DC? Yes. I'm, are we yes, all I'm, born in DC? Are we all I, born in DC? Are we all? Oh, okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. No, but I was born in DC and then my sister, so sickle cell runs in our family, right? My, one of my sisters has sickle cell anemia and moving here is like, you know, it gets cold, man. It's not good for anybody yeah. with sickle cell. So she would keep having like crises and things like that. So after a year, I was born here and literally after one year, like we moved to Florida for why? Because it was hot. Your mom was ma- is making moves, making the right decisions. Yeah, man. I know. Wow. She was hey. out here. Wow. She was out here. So- I'm going to go back to uh, something that you said earlier about yeah. repetition. I'm really drawn to yeah. this idea of how the process of preparing for your pieces 
is very repetitive, but then also how repetition plays within the performances. Yeah. And especially that in relation to your exploration of labor. Yeah. I don't know. There's something for me, um, cause I remember somebody asked me this. It was actually one of my ceramics teachers, like in my senior year, she was asking me, she had seen my thesis, you know, and I made this long piece of rope and I had all my performers tying knots because that's how I started getting into making rope in the first place was tying knots. So I was like, it only makes sense to have my performance, my, my, my performers do that, you know? And that in and of itself is very repetitive and very difficult and very laborious, right? So, especially with a piece of rope that long. But she had asked me, she was like, what is like, you know, um, making rope and, and tying knots? Like, what is it for you, really? Like, what does it do? And I was like, for me, it just becomes a way of, you know, thinking about home, thinking about place, thinking about, you know, the many things that my grandmother also does with her hands, you know, my mother also, like it, 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 it brings me to a place where, you know, I can, I can start to feel like at least physically I'm connecting with just more than myself, you know? And, and for me, like doing something repetitively, it's like, there's always opportunity for discovery in my opinion, as much as it seems repetitive and tedious, like something always does happen regardless, you know, in terms of like, even how the material starts to work. I like discovering material. So for me, it's like, you got to just keep doing it and keep toying with it over and over and over again until it starts to do things that you don't expect. You know, I'm more so interested in the happy accidents also. Following repetitive practices, at least for me, it's like a way of finding place. That's very much what this piece is about, you know, trying to be whole and then living in parts. It's, it's, it's very much about finding place in terms of culturally, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of just like heritage lineage wise as a first generation American, I'm really interested in how like people are navigating that in general and how we can talk about it through the body. So yeah, reposition is important. Hmm. A lot of my pieces only, they, a lot of my pieces really begin with doing the same thing like over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> And like I, it's it's kind of crazy now that I think about it yeah <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous so it, it, no it really is <laughs> like wow why do you um, why do you think why do you think it's ridiculous why just because like oh god you know I'm even thinking about like when I made my when I made my spoon like and I had to make the cups for it like god I made like probably over like 200 cups or something 250 cups and I like like in the process of like actually, you know, making a set that I was like, okay. And it was like, maybe a set of like 10. <laughs> in terms of form that were like, you know, concise and specific, because at the same time I was trying to throw the same form over and over and over again, 55 times. And I was like, shit, like it has to be perfect, right? So at first when I was figuring out what I wanted the cup to look like, it took me the longest time. I was sitting there throwing for like four weeks, you know? I was just like, no over and over and over again doing 10 in a row like no this isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah you know i find it, it makes so interesting sense, that people who can do this like i could <laughs> not i could not do this i would have an existential crisis but <laughs> you're like it's like you're having one like with the material though a thousand percent <laughs> yeah a thousand percent a thousand percent i would at some point walk in and be so frustrated like some of my bosses that would walk by because i worked in like a few departments at the corcoran and walk by and be like, get up and go smoke. Go for a smoke outside. <laughs> just leave. Just leave it alone. Just stop. It's not your day. Just leave it alone. You're not about to go back to the wheel. If you're not happy at the wheel, it's just not going to work for you. If you're not calm at the wheel, it's not yeah. going to work. They're like, nope. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, I, I think that's how that's that, but that's how we manifest what it is that we desire, you know? For in sure. The, in that time, in that, in that preparation. And I, I think that's one of the other things that folks who, who aren't artists um, don't necessarily understand because right. it, they see the final product and they don't think that it takes time like, ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to make yeah. these, 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 these works. It takes For time. Sure. You, you're thinking about it. You're researching. Yeah. You're taking breaks because you are always looking for something. You're always looking for something that is perfect, even though you yeah. know that you know, the idea of perfection is something that is just, it, it, it might not be realistic, but perfection could be something that's imperfect. You know yeah. what I mean? So just thinking about that and taking the time to make those 200 cups and right, really right, right. That, going through that therapy, 
you know the headspace of like wait yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah. i like that you said something perfect is also it can also be something imperfect because for me yeah. i gave up on i gave up on perfection the wheel will bring that out of me sometimes if i'm making objects for like a person or you know it's a commission or whatever and like you know perfection is important at that point yes for sure that's mm -hmm. something i'm very mm -hmm. like anal about a thousand percent if it's for somebody mm -hmm. else me i've given up on the idea i gave up on perfection like i feel like at the beginning of my practice at some point mm -hmm. i started telling myself like a friend of mine he was like you make things that are like ugly <laughs> and i was like i do i remember he told me that and i was like this is so true though he was like it's not that it's like ugly, like, you know, in its core, but it's just, it's, you know, visually, like, it's just like, you don't make things that are like, oh, you know, like you're looking at it and you're like, wow, it's so beautiful. Like what a nice object or whatever. He's like, you just don't make things like that. You literally make a mess. That's it. That's all you do. And I was like, damn. Yes. <laughs> it is true. You do make a mess. That is true. Well, it's a beautiful mess. I was mess. like, this is it's true. It's a beautiful like, mess. True. Yes. I know. So for me, perfection, I'm like, everything I make is ugly. If you like it, you like it. <laughs> then it's ugly pretty. You know, we can, we can, we can start to talk pretty. about it. Well, pretty, I don't think it's ugly. pretty ugly there you go i don't either that's not the, that is not the adjective i would have used <laughs> but i'm i'm curious still like how can you elaborate more though on the idea of labor and maybe some of the yeah so maybe this can also segue into some of the other issues that you explore within your pieces for sure so i told you guys that i really i was big on anatomy so the labor of the body in general you know, on a daily basis when we're asleep and when we're awake to me is something that I'm always thinking about, you know, because it's so it's like, you know, it's our vessel for like this life, right? It's how you feel and like experience your environment. And there's not a moment in time where it is not constantly at work. Yes, literally, like not one moment in time, Why, whether you're conscious for it or not, you know, so for me, labor is very important. And when I started especially when I came to DC, there were a lot of like cultural shifts for me because, you know, I'm coming from Florida. So, um, you know, coming from a place where, you know, it's, it's Southern hospitality and racism is, is a little more just, it's, it's like they own it shamelessly, you know, like it's, it's, it's not something that's like hidden that I have to look for that like is going to, you know, morph into a different, uh form and present itself to me as if i don't know what racism is but that's really what happens like coming up here so i was i was kind of really shocked in that respect and going to the corcoran and you know it's like a white institution because it was at the, at the time they had merged with gw so it was just a lot to navigate you know in that space so thinking about being in that headspace and, and really wanting to involve labor in terms of um my work and my practice and being a black woman also going through these things and like, you know, growing up and going to college basically and like trying to get an education. Um, unseen labor was something that I was really interested in. That's kind of what led me to make my spoon, you know, thinking about just the position that society has put black women in, you know, in the sense of like really servicing everyone, including like black men as well, you know, and thinking about like that dynamic of, I had a person, it was kind of great. She, Deidre, um, she came to my performance and the whole uh, setup for me was because I was interested in function. I was interested in labor. I was interested in unseen labor and I was interested in um, really how uncomfortable I can make my audience and how connected they would have to be with the objects that I make in the space and how they're being used in the space. Because I was thinking about the fact that we don't have a lot of connections to the materials that we use on a daily basis, right? So I made a bunch of cups and I had made this large, large spoon that's like unnecessarily large. <laughs> and I had it squatted on my, and I, and I squatted with it on my back and I had oat milk in it with like honey. And I had you know, two of my friends performing as waiters walking around, um, basically saying, please have another one, right? Or like, please, some, some milk. It's, it, and they would be like, it's vegan. <laughs> like they were really like trying to sell it to my audience members. And at some point, everybody that took a cup, when they would try to give it back as you would for anything, like you think it's a taste tester, they're like, no, again, please serve yourself because <laughs> we're going to keep this going until there's no more milk because that's how, how long she's going to have to be here for. Mm. And it's for your pleasure. And it's being delivered to you and like offered to you as if it's something pleasurable. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. But behind it is very much something that's like, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm squatting and I'm shaking and I got 70 something pounds, you know, around my waist and, and I'm trying to endure, you know, and, and that's kind of the reality of that. So I was really thinking about 
um, you know, labor to me is important. So the labor of the body is important, especially when we start talking about identity. That was that aspect of it. But um, what? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go, 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 go. Yeah. I, I'm just curious as far as because we 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 saw this. Um, yeah. And what is what is if you could just let everyone know what the name of the work is? Oh, the the name of the work is Fed. So yeah, I had made that spoon. Jesus, that was sourced metal. That was all scrap metal. Oh I, wow! I totally, totally nicked from a construction. Um, <laughs> from a construction. Love it. Material right. junkie. Material junkie. It's called junkie, found. It's called found objects. Found. Found objects. exactly. Found objects. <laughs> exactly. But I, exactly. what I was about to ask is, so what was the reaction? Was it the reaction that you were looking for from the audience? Yeah. So the I, I don't even know if I walked in with a specific intended reaction in mind. I think. Mm -hmm. Every time I make work and I'm making a performance and I'm trying to trigger a response from my audience members, it's most, most often it's discomfort. It ends up being that naturally. Um, but what was interesting for me was, and I, that's what I was about to get into, was this girl, Deidre, she came to my piece and she saw, she, she, didn't, she didn't take a cup, like she refused. Mm -hmm. And she's a black woman. And I remember she found me like at an event somewhere, like, Oh, weeks later or something. And she was like, I saw your performance and I didn't take a cup, you know why? And I was like, why? She's like, because I knew if I fed into this system, she was like, if I didn't take a cup, you didn't need to be there. So I'm not about to do that. I'm not yeah. about to play that and feed into the system that you were trying to create. People fell into it. And I was like, exactly. And I was like, that is something. I was like, that was phenomenal. To me, I was like, wow. Oh my God. Like, I think I clapped. Yeah, when she told right. me, I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I was like, okay, that's, that is, that is, those are the types of responses that I'm interested in, you know, as much as I, 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 I want a result, of course, with some of my work at the same time, I do want a challenge, you know, I'm interested in the audience numbers that are taking it in a completely different respect. I mean, it's the back it's and forth. I had somebody interrupt my spoon performance uh -huh. and take one of the big Mason jars that I had the oat milk in. And she tried to scoop the whole thing out. And she was telling me, she was like, just lean back. Like she was really like over the whole performance. Like she walked oh. in and she was like, I need to get her out of this situation. <laughs> Literally, she was like, I can't do it. Like she couldn't watch it. She was like, no, 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 no. And then she's like, nobody's going to drink enough. She like got worried or whatever, I think. And she literally like took this big mason jar and like was telling me, she's like, tilt it back so I can put the milk back in the jar. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I wow. was wondering, I mean, thinking about <laughs> who actually did, you know, not feed into the system and yeah. who actually wanted to help you and, and get, you know, just get you past that and but what's, who these people are. And, you know, just I'm I, for me, I'm just like, if I was sure. there, I'd be standing around, I'll be looking at people like, oh, yeah, yeah, interesting yeah, because I too would not have drank the milk. Right. Like, I would not have done that. I would have been like, but what's nah. interesting though, too, is what we consider help in this respect because exactly. of the fact that what no it's what it's what we consider help in this respect because like she was like I didn't take a cup because I didn't want to feed into your system and I knew you wouldn't be there she was conceptually helpful a thousand percent but physically <laughs> in the experience if you refuse to drink then I am left there squatting for however long until See, somebody this, may this is come so, up this and is take so a cup or until I just give up and until my legs give up do you know what I mean this is if so everyone were to though. refuse I would not yeah. have a ta my task would be incomplete so I would be there just waiting. See, it's, it's, it's also, <laughs> it's also, what do you do within that white box, within that gallery space? Right. Because even though you're not taking a cup, she didn't move forward into another action where let's say that the other woman was like, no, look, dump it out. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I was thinking like, <laughs> if I was standing right there, what would I have done besides not taking the cup? What would I have right. done to, to get rid of this situation when I knew that you were standing right there, clearly having physical pain of sorts or going through right. all of these physical, uh, this phys physical drama, what would I have done as opposed to, because I, I know me and I know I wouldn't have stood right there and just been like, I'm not taking a cup and I'm just like, I, right. I wonder. It, it, I just I thought about myself in that situation when I was when I was watching it. I was like, damn, what would I what would I have done? Yeah, like there's something about to you know you invite people to your shows and stuff, and like you invite friends, and everybody knows that you're doing a performance. And also, it's it's different when your audience 
your audience, they want it to work. You know, they want your performance to work. So of course, like a bunch of people are going to just like take a cup and drink naturally because they're like, oh my God, like this is what she's asking us to do. We have to do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, but, I mean, it's I, a, a real, just real, one more thing, just about that. <laughs> just because it's so, it's so, it's really, it really comes to the idea of being in that white box and the people yeah. who go into the white box and what they're expecting and how they think. Because if that were to happen in the public sphere outside with people who don't necessarily go into the art space, you know, they, who knows what could have happened? You know what I mean? It would, it, it the reception been- would be very different. I've always yeah. imagined, I've always imagined it like again, somewhere where I know no one. <laughs> you know Mm -hmm. where no one knows anyone really and I am really like a pure stranger because I think like you know once you build a community and you start getting shows and etc and everybody starts coming and whatnot at some point you know people kind of know you so they're like okay yeah like oh my god she's gonna do this weird thing like yeah let's like go see her like let's go for (laughs) this let's go for us it's gonna be ugly and weird yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be (laughs) freaky and weird let's gonna be freaky and and weird yeah Yeah, there we go this is so interesting on so many different lo- levels because of course, like my brain, when I first saw this piece was like thinking about what's the objective here? Like, what does she want us to take away about capitalism and about consumption, right? And then it's interesting to hear you talk about how you weren't, you, maybe the objective was just again, to make people uncomfortable and to foster some sort of dialogue and that works well. And I'm wondering like with this piece and maybe actually yeah, maybe more like with your future pieces, like how activism is really being incorporated into your work, how you have maybe larger or maybe not, maybe larger activist goals. So bigger For objectives sure. other than just like maybe generating conversation within that space. For sure. So there's something about, for me, and especially making Fed and thinking about um, Capitalism, of course, consumption, but also capitalism is like it thrives and, and, and functions off of the black body and the, 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 the person supplying those black bodies is black women, because if black women did not have kids, there would not be enough black people to use in this respect. I'm really sorry if there were not <laughs> if there were not consistently black children being born, this would not be a thing. <laughs> Like we know men are a thing also, but like they're literal sperm donors, like respect to them. But you know what I mean? I'm like, <laughs> at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's just the reality of the fact. So, because they can't have babies. Well, you know, they can, but like, you guys know what I mean, yes. regardless. So we, in we terms, of, in, terms of, in terms of political, in terms of political opinions, of course, I was looking at it from a perspective of, um, like fed, especially it was about function. It was about how we interact with objects day to day, how we don't associate bodies with objects in general, because the object has been made as in as it has been touched, you know, and thinking about what we're intimate with that we're so dissociated from. So a spoon, one of my, my, one of my professors who gave like 80 million spoon demos, he was like, you know, the spoon is one of the most intimate objects of, you know, that we use. Like it's one of the only utensils that's actually fully in your body, your body, like in your body when you use it. Because the fork will rest at like the tip of your tongue, you know, Mm -hmm. but a spoon you will fully insert into your mouth, right? Mm. So he was like, it's one of the most intimate, you know, like uh, utensils that we interact with. And I was like, that's very true, you know? So just, and and intimacy is a thing. The intimacy that we have with objects, the intimacy that we have with material is a thing that I think is really important. And it becomes very much important in terms of politics when we start talking about you know identities and embodied experiences i did a piece with um a palestinian friend of mine and i had read angela davis's book from ferguson to palestine and i called it what we carry because how she came about it which is radical and amazing but it's something that i see consistently with people that are like really really analyzing how it is we are operating and moving in society you know but she was like, the material connections between the U.S. and Israel is just so strong. Literally, they're using the same ammunition to kill Palestinian bodies over there that they are using to kill Black people here. It's the same ammunition trained by forces, Israeli forces, the U.S. police forces are, you know? And that was something that I was really paying attention to. And she was talking about the material connection between these identities and these experiences. And then I was thinking about 
me and her basically took um, the line, you know, the Gaza Strip basically, but we took this whole line that they refer to as a snake, you know, for the territory. We took it and condensed it into DC and we walked it the entire day. It was like maybe like nine or 10 hours or something like that. We walked it on foot. And we had these bullets because of the fact that that was a material connection, we wore them, you know? So we like cracked them open. I had made these shells out of um, ceramics and then we filled it with cement and I had dyed the tip of it red, you know? So we started at one point, we cracked it and then we walked it all the way to DC and then walked it to the White House, you know? Starting in like Southeast. Um, so that's the thing is like material is really important when we start talking about how it's actually, you know, we have very intimate connections with material and intimate relationships with material that I think, you know, sometimes are not really looked at in, in, in ways that they should be. As in like, yes, the material does deeply affect like the ammunition. Yes, it affects Palestinian women as well. I was also looking at it from a feminist perspective, like Palestinian women and black women also have to walk around with this idea of the fact that if you're ever going to be carrying a child, you know, whether you're a mom yet or not, the idea of carrying a baby is something to a degree that is fearful at the end of the day, because you have to understand that you're carrying a child in a society where it's looking at your creation, right? This part of you, this being, this new being as essentially disposable by the state. Like it is, that's how it's, that's, that's you know, and, and functioning in a society and in an, in an environment where you have to think about that as a woman was something that I was really interested in. And Arij was, she is phenomenal. She's so talented and she's an amazing artist. And when we started talking, it was just kind of happening naturally. I just started like asking her questions and we're both Muslim. So I was like, okay, let's go. You know, mm. I was like, what, what about this? You know, she was like, people are literally trying to eradicate Palestinians. She's like, that's the goal. I don't think that everybody understands that. And I was like, that, this is the thing. Like, you know, she's like, as long as she's like, but as long as there are Palestinian women having babies, Palestinians will live forever. And I was like, that's exactly the point, you know? So, so that's, it's, but, you know, looking at what you said about as long as black women continue to have babies, then this is yeah, how exactly. the force is being fed. And she said, well, as long as Palestinian women continue to have Palestinians, this is they'll how be we Palestinians survive. forever. So yeah. it, 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 I'm looking at the contrast almost because um, it's, it feels like, you know, there's this tension between that, the, those statements, because, you know, as a black woman, you're thinking, okay, when I do produce this child and I'm thinking about material again, this, right. this child is considered material labor. Like you use right. the word disposable, this child is continued, uh, considered disposable material and it's for my labor, whatever I need, whoever is saying this right. um, within society, who takes and, and, and breaks and murders and massacres uh, black people. And then I'm thinking about what with the Palestinians and the continuation of the, the tradition, the continuation of the people. And if you don't continue, then you will actually go extinct. So then you right. are caught in the middle with I think, how I are, think you, black what are you women supposed and, to do? Yeah, exactly. You know, because I, I know it's something I've thought about um, for sure, you know, throughout my life about having children in the United States. Thinking yeah. like, oh my God, you know, I know how I feel right now as a black woman. I knew how I felt as a black girl. I knew how I felt as a exactly. black young lady where exactly. it was like, I don't want to feel fearful for my life, but I can't help it. Yeah. So thinking about, but I want to continue my, what I learned. I want to pass exactly. that on. There we go. To build there that strength. Go. You know what I mean? So, so it's, it's it, so it's this, it's, it's, it's this hard place for both people, I think, you know? And that's where a lot of questions kind of happen where it's like, what do we do? And what are we supposed to do? And at that point, it's like, this is where I say I make work to ask questions, you know, not really to answer them in this respect. You know, the work might be an attempt to answer a question that I had maybe for myself or something, but it will in like in the end, probably ask more questions than, than it answers, mm -hmm. you know, but I think that that's important. Yeah, especially if we're talking about politics, it's a lot of things that you know. Just like there's a lot of 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 things to consider, of people, of of experiences, you know, of systems in general to consider when we start talking about, yeah, when we start talking about activism and politics. So it's a lot.
I'm wondering how do you, after you do these pieces, particularly with this one, with yeah. Carrie, how are you engaging in dialogue with people who experience the piece? So it was kind of difficult to do that because of the fact that we were on the move all the time. So mm -hmm. I, this was, and this was for a class of mine, yeah. mind you. I took, I took um, a public spectacle course with um, a brilliant lady. She was one of the first women to tell me to perform in general, um, Carmen Montoya, but she, um, she had this class and it was phenomenal. And I did this piece in response to her class. You know, I was reading this book at the time and I was like, okay. And I was in a, a, a black radicalism class and a black literature class at the same time. And I was like, okay, I think I know what I'm going to do guys, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it was something where me and her were, it was, it was kind of funny because our, our walk, this was the longest time I had ever spent with Arish ever, honestly, like one-on-one. -on -one. I think this is like one of the longest conversations we've ever had. And it was like, we were kind of just talking here and there. Sometimes we wouldn't speak at all, but it would be people driving by as we were on the move that we're like, what are you guys doing? Somebody thought we were working out. <laughs> I swear to you. Cause it seems like we're like, walking with these like cement whatever but you were forms you're working out. we were like holding like uh what's it called again and they were strapped to our to our chest like i made her a chest harness and same for myself you know so they were dragging behind us so it looks like we're like you know doing some crossfit or maybe i guess I yeah <laughs> but, i tell you that so anatomy public... interest came into play that the studying and those right. those straight a's yeah. yeah yeah so getting getting public reaction for me wasn't um it wasn't really my first concern because of the fact that I knew we were just going to be moving the entire time. You know, it was about the walk for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, but there wasn't really a way where people could. Where you oh could yeah. No. So I had sent the entire, Oh my God, a thousand percent. So I had sent the entire route. This was like years ago. So I'm sorry. I'm forgetting all of it, but I had okay. sent out the whole route that we were going to be on like from you know beginning at i think what noon or like 11 a.m or something like that you know by the hour like where we were going to be you know so people could walk by or come and document etc cetera, etc cetera. i had shared my location with multiple folks um but yeah because it was for this class and it was to me it just seemed like a piece that i was doing more so for my practice and not for show you know it was, it was, it was more so about the research in that respect. Like a study piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really, really a lot about research for me in that respect because of the fact that I was not um, well-versed either on the Palestinian and Israeli conflict in general, mm -hmm. you know? So when I had started and it's like, I, I knew enough, but I was in my brain, I was like, I'm not well-versed to start talking about these things with my work and like, you know, put my body into it. So I like sat for like a few months, you know? And like just read a lot and like talk to a few friends. Um, yeah. But yeah, audience, audience reactions. It's, it's more interesting to see how people react in the aftermath, I feel. But I, that's also because I feel like people, enough people didn't see the work at the time. I didn't, I didn't know enough folks. <laughs> well, well I, you know, thinking about that and then going back to what we were talking about earlier about, well, what you're doing, working in your home space, just like you yeah. know, all of us are. And thinking about public reaction, even in the thereafter, right now during this isolation, how have you maneuvered through this? You know, because you said earlier that it's been, you know, it was difficult. You know, thinking it's about it's been creating. difficult for sure. At some point, I mean, when when COVID started, I was like, God, I think I like called my professor because we're more friends now than than he is my professor. <laughs> Think. And that's David actually. He connected. Oh, okay, yeah. no, David. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, David yeah. is like my dear friend. Like I love him at this point. Like he was my professor when I was a freshman, and now we're just friends. Like I don't even look at him as a professor anymore. He's awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's the dude that gave all the spoon demos. That's David. But oh, okay. Yeah, okay. exactly. All right. So he loves spoons. He's just he's just that type of guy. Um, he's he's an interesting <laughs> fella. He's very interesting. He's a total weirdo. <laughs> Oh my God. And I'm so sorry, but my brain is running away from me. What question did you ask me initially? I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's just about it's the sign of know, a bad genius. Am I dealing, it's just about dealing with, um, Oh my God. Yes. Dealing with COVID. So exactly. 
I called him and I was like, David, what the fuck is the point? I was literally like, those are my exact words. I was like, I just don't. I, there was a period of time where I was like not motivated to make anything because I was like, I mean, what is this worth at this point? I should have just been a surgeon. I would have been more useful. Literally. That was really like where I was Ooh, at. Oh, so that like, essentiality question came up. Ooh. Yeah. So there was, I, yeah. there was this, there was this discussion of like actual function. Like, is my work really doing anything? Mm. Because of mm. the fact that I was like, I could have just been a doctor and like actually had, you know, feasible, tangible results in terms of the work you do, you know, and affecting people. Right. Mm. Mm. Yes. Can I jump off of this question of essentiality? Please. Because Please. one of the things that I found really interesting is on one of your Instagram posts, when you documented the self-portrait that you had mentioned earlier, yeah. you had said that the collective that you were working with, the Black Artist Research Space, you said yes. that the Black Artist Research Space truly sees art as a form of research. Yeah. And in, an, and in another post for about your, another project of yours called Taught, you describe oh God, it. Yeah. As, yeah. You describe it as art practice like religion can be a visceral experience that encompasses the mind and body. This work investigates the parallels between religious and artistic practice and the balance between restraint and security. And so I was wondering, like, can you elaborate on these state on these statements and how you feel art, like as ritual, as research, is essential? I can argue about why I think it's essential, <laughs> but having heard what you just said, now I'm like. How are you thinking right now about the essentiality? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's one of the hardest in my brain and I'm not trying to, to, to make it seem like the most difficult thing, but like, it's for me, I think if we start talking about how essential art is, when we start, then we start talking about like what the job is, you know, of the artist, you know, like what it is you're doing and what it is you're putting out there, you know? And there, it's like we have a job. It's kind of the job to observe and analyze and take in so that way you can sit there and look for all of the loopholes that people are missing or all the things that are not being connected to then show, to then trigger responses in other folks to change their minds about how they're perceiving, you know, their experiences and whatnot. So I'm just like, it's, it's a very difficult job, but it is essential, I think, you know? And I feel like it's the only way that we've been you know, human experiences have been archived through art for like, you know, since way before we were even like a thing, you know, way before we like had all these limbs and we're moving the way we do now and like had cell phones and stuff like way before the industrial revolution, agricultural revolution, like way before, like this is how people yep. were like, like archiving their lives, like, and their experiences. Like for some reason, somebody felt the need to go in there and like write it down, you know, or like, like make an image to like understand or like just to mark yeah. what they had just seen. Like there's something about archiving and, and keeping up with and being a steward of your experiences in the sense of, you know, writing them down or like having them exist in another form, you know, or making with that in mind. I think there's something too powerful about that to not be essential in my opinion. <laughs> hey, yep. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I totally, totally agree. So we, we see how, you know, it's just, <laughs> These, these changes happen as we have been in this isolation and we're thinking about yeah. and we're creating and understanding deeper ourselves um, as creators, you know, what it is and what it means to be creators. Um, so we're at, we're, we're, we're at time. We're almost, we're oh almost, God, we're, no. we're basically there. Why did I like flew by? Oh my God. I know. Well, you know, when it, when it's good, when it's good, it always, <laughs> you, know, you know, like we said, we have a surprise question. I know. <laughs> I was excited. Yes. And uh, so we have to prepare for this. We have to prepare. Are you going to count it down? And, and we're going to do this on three. Okay. So I'm ready. I'm ready for the three, special one, sparkly question. Two, three. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You guys are amazing. Wow, uh -huh. the unicorn. Sparkly. It's epic, man. You know what's funny is I was talking to my mom about this. She has a, a new puppy and the Aww. puppy keeps collecting things all over the house and keeping it in the bed, like a ball of yarn, a shoe. Oh my God, that's so they, super they were cute. Like, she's like a unicorn collecting treasure. And I was like, oh, yes. So this is like our collecting treasure question. Hell yeah. What we would like to know, in your utopia, 
there would be in my utopia wow there would be mm. oh god <laughs> damn that's a good question okay um ooh damn too many good things in my utopia um no one would ever go hungry white men are not on top anymore women can't gain weight anywhere besides their ass <laughs> <laughs> and there's free weed for everybody and and it's fully fully decriminalized and no one ever gets arrested for, for smoking it or selling it publicly ever ever yeah love it awesome that sounds and like probably a lot of rope and twine and metal as yes well. yes and in my <laughs> utopia there's endless material and endless. i live and i live on a farm where i can just dig up clay and do pit fires and rock crew firings and all these things just all the time <laughs> and i just make work repeatedly for years in solitude and no one in the art world ever sees me until like i have a show or something that's like my dream yeah wow <laughs> yes. really yes. wow yes. Okay. i'm like i just sit in my corner on like a nice home that i've hopefully made for myself or whatever somewhere not in america oh yes <laughs> with a big open space near like the beach or something somewhere large i need somewhere vast near me it just needs to be a situation so yeah oh my god totally understand. yeah i love that just totally making just making work for years and just yeah love it yeah love sounds it. amazing sounds like my utopia wow this is a great question though <laughs> <laughs> good good <laughs> feel free to cut out my ass comment but i mean or keep it no, though. Wait, or keep it though. Not. we're keeping or that. keep it though there we go i'm like go for it <laughs> Love, I love it all. Good. So Yasin, how can people find you on social media and how can maybe people contact you about like commissions, for example, or your. Yes. So I have my email and my Instagram on my website. It's www.yasintilalafall.com. It's very long. It's just my name. And my email is on that website as well. In terms of contact info on Instagram, I'm Yasin underscore Tilala. And I also have my website link in my bio. So yeah, anybody is free to yum on me. Well, so thank you guys so much for having me though. It was really Thank you honor. so much for being here. Yes. You guys are amazing. Yes. I love what you guys are doing. I've never been on a podcast before. So I'm super happy that you guys popped my cherry. Oh, yay. I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, the work and continuing to build relationships yeah. and all that. So hell yeah. Definitely Same. excited. And I, and I definitely, yeah. the transformers, the transformers, um, work when will transformer that gallery it's june yeah. it's opens june 5th and i believe it's going to close sometime early july like july okay. 3rd or something i have All performances right. it's going to be a set of three I'm working with a friend of mine who's a dancer so i'm super excited hope this oh, will be good cool. yeah we're trying to do it again though in the woods because you know me i gotta get freaky yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's gotta get yeah. weird thank you guys All so right, much so, thank you this is awesome Yes. In the, yeah, yes, I know. Next time. Like, in, the next time. in the world. In the world. Have a next can... time. Yes, I know. There we go. In the world, actually. That'd be awesome. But <laughs> a thousand percent. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. Don't forget to find us on social media and to subscribe to our YouTube channel because that's how we know that you love us. <laughs> no, but seriously, subscribe so you'll always know when to reflect, recalibrate. Oh, also... Don't forget to check out the notes to this podcast episode for links to all the resources we reference in this interview, as well as the music and sound effects we feature. We even include details about the fab apparel we're decking out. Don't be shy to hit us up with questions. <laughs>